listening to The Sower, a podcast of the Ciceronian Society. The Ciceronian Society is a community of Christian scholars and public intellectuals committed to the examination of three core themes, tradition, place, and things divine, and their role in the intellectual discipleship of the church and of civilization generally. To learn more about us, our events, the podcast, our journal, Pietas, to sign up for our newsletter and to make your tax-deductible gift, please go to ciceronianSociety.org. That's C-I-C-E-R-O-N-I-A-N-S-O-C-I-E-T-Y dot org. I am Josh Bowman, the Vice President of the Ciceronian Society, and before introducing our guests, please join me in a brief prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray, O Lord, that you would bless our conversation and that all we say and do would bring glory and honor to you. Amen. We're recording this on Friday, July 21st, and I'm thrilled to be joined by Mr. Landon Lofton. Landon is a husband, father, and a PhD candidate at Faulkner University, and uh, we had lots of people from Faulkner University at our conference recently, and he is a teacher at Gravitas, uh, a global extension of the Stony Brook School. He recently co-authored a book, uh, which we're going to discuss today, on the life and writings of Owen Barfield. He co-authored that book with Max Leaf. Um, the book is called What Barfield Thought. Uh, Landon lives with his wife and three children in Bolivar, Missouri. That's how you say it, right? Bolivar? Bolivar. Bolivar. I was close, close man. Enough. I was close enough. <laughs> I, 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 I've actually been there, and I almost called it uh, Bolivar. Oh, yeah. uh, I, was, I was immediately <laughs> corrected. Um, well, thank you. Thank you for joining us for the show. I should mention that the book, the full book title is What Barfield Thought, an Introduction to the Work of Owen Barfield, published by Cascade Books this year. Um, now, I'm so excited this book even exists, because as others have said, the neglect of Owen Barfield's work is a tragedy at best, mm-hmm. um, and he usually just lives as a footnote to C.S. Lewis and Tolkien, um, which is unfortunate, and I think uh, Lewis and Tolkien themselves would uh, hope that that, was, that would be changed too. Mm-hmm. So let's start this conversation off uh, by uh, uh, the the most <laughs> perhaps the the most basic question, who the heck was Owen Barfield? Yeah, yeah. Well, for starters, he was a British philologist and philosopher, but he's best mm-hmm. known for his involvement with the Oxford Inklings, as you said, his advocacy of something called anthroposophy, and also for his writings about things like language and poetry and what he called the evolution of human consciousness. So, in some circles. He's known for his interpretation of Samuel Taylor Coleridge's philosophy, Mm -hmm. which uh, comes from a book he wrote called What Coleridge Thought. You might have guessed Mm -hmm. that served as an inspiration for our treatment of Barfield. Okay. Well, um, now was he uh, was he educated at Oxford or Cambridge? Is he a is that Oxford? Yeah. He he and Lewis became friends because they were undergraduates together at Oxford. Okay. Did did he go to war uh, in uh, World War One as well? Uh huh. He was in the signal service, so unlike Lewis and Tolkien, he didn't see some of the uh, uh, the worst of the action. Uh, but mm-hmm. nevertheless, he was in, he was in the military and deployed during World War One. Now, one of the things I, in a, about his life that I'm I, I, I'm vaguely remembering, and one of the interesting dynamics of his life with uh, his friendship with C.S. Lewis was it, was Owen Barfield a person of faith or my. Mm -hmm. Recollection is that he was not. Yeah, well, that is a common myth. Uh, Barfield was baptized into the Anglican Church as an adult. Oh, really? Okay. And there are people who question the orthodoxy of some of his beliefs, in particular (laughs) those beliefs that are related to what I mentioned, anthroposophy. That's an intellectual movement that was founded by a man named Rudolf Steiner. Uh, Mm -hmm. Steiner considered himself a Christian. Uh, Barfield considered himself a Christian. C.S. Lewis considered Barfield a Christian. That's Nevertheless, important. there are a lot of people who are a little bit suspicious of some of the beliefs connected to anthroposophy that might understandably make some Christians a little uncomfortable. Right. Yeah. And that's to be expected. Mm-hmm. Um, and Barfield was so, so smart. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> my, yeah. I, um, I, I read his book... Um, I tried to read his book, uh, I should say, uh, What Coleridge Thought mm-hmm. back in grad school. I, I, I took this class on German idealism, and I, you know, so it was in grad school, you have to write a research paper, and I'm like, I'm, I can't write a paper on Hegel or <laughs> Kant. I'm just, I'm just not that gifted. Yeah. But, hey, Coleridge was influenced by them. Maybe this will be easier, and anyone who's ever read Coleridge knows that's stupid. 
Um, so, uh, but it was actually it was one of the more enjoyable, one of the most enjoyable papers I ever read, and that's actually how I personally discovered Barfield was mm-hmm. I was reading, uh, I found his book in the library at Catholic University of America and was like, oh, well, this guy's interesting. Oh, he's an inkling. Yeah. Um, and uh, I was, I was immediately, ta- I mean, he, he was, I, I cannot claim to have understood uh, all of the book, yeah. uh, but how did you become interested in his work? Yeah, well, it started for me when I wrote a master's thesis on C.S. Lewis's understanding of the imagination, the role okay. it plays in theology and apologetics. And in the course of my research, I learned that Lewis's view of the imagination was forged in the fire of intense arguments with this mysterious but brilliant man, Owen Barfield. Mm -hmm. And so I, of course, started reading Barfield's books and quickly began to understand why Lewis called Barfield the wisest and best of his unofficial teachers, despite their ongoing disagreements. (laughs) So in my research, uh, I just I found myself totally enthralled by Barfield, his absolutely capacious mind. And though his books are, as you noted, very difficult to read, which is why we wanted to write an introduction, Right, they are absolute gold mines of insight into a whole range of subjects, especially the history of the human mind. Mm -hmm. I might want to bring that uh, that theme of imagination back up later, uh, Mm -hmm. but it'll it'll fit um, somewhere else. Um, Now, we've already kind of discussed this... uh, can we get a little more details, though, on his connection to the Oxford Inklings themselves? I mean, he was, yeah. he was more than just C.S. Lewis's friend. Mm-hmm. I actually might be a good idea. Um, this is our first podcast that we've had. We actually talked about, uh, I think, the Inklings, which is actually surprising to me. Mm-hmm. Um, so tell the folks, uh, who, who, who were the Inklings and where was Barfield's place in that? Yeah, there, there are disagreements about how we can best characterize the Inklings, Right, but whatever right. they were, it was an informal society of friends, I think, that were connected all with C.S. Lewis in one way or another. He was sort of the center of it. But uh, Barfield and Lewis, I think, were the original Inklings. I think their friendship is where we first see that sort of distinctive spirit of this group of men who loved literature, who were imaginative and scholarly, and loved to get together and have a good quarrel. <laughs> So they, uh, they were all remarkable people. They all helped each other and sharpened each other's thinking. Um, they would read drafts aloud of their ongoing works, either of you know, philosophy or theology or of fiction. And uh, some of the, the great works like the Chronicles of Narnia and the, the Hobbit and the Lord of the Rings and these, uh, out of this mutual criticism society grew these just wonderful, wonderful books that we uh, we still read today, and hopefully people will be reading for many generations to come. But that, go ahead. No, you, you, you go. Yeah, so, so Barfield had an important role to play in the Inklings. Uh, some point out that because he wasn't at very many meetings, you know, they had these famous meetings at a, a little pub called the Bird and Baby, and then sometimes mm-hmm. at Lewis's quarters at Magdalen College. Mm-hmm. Uh, because Barfield wasn't at many of the meetings, they downplay his the role that he played in this group and in the um, sort of distinctive literary and theological legacy that's followed in their wake. Uh, but of course, I think we argue that while that is true, Barfield's thought was foundational to the distinctive spirit and assumptions of the group. And in particular, what we find in his book, an early book, Poetic Diction, that had a big influence on especially Lewis and Tolkien. At least we know that he had an influence on them. I don't, I'm not sure about the others, to be honest. Um, we yeah. don't have strong evidence. But Lewis made it easy for us because he was forthcoming throughout his life about <laughs> the profound impact that Barfield's thinking, especially as it's put forward in poetic diction, had on him. And so, yeah, so Lewis owed this incalculable intellectual debt to Barfield. And he freely acknowledged it throughout his life. And for example, if you read Surprised by Joy, Lewis's spiritual autobiography, you find an account of what Lewis called the great war between himself and Barfield. And, I you remember know, that, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's funny. They both fought in the great war. But to them, what really mattered was this uh, argument they were having about the <laughs> nature and function of the imagination. Mm-hmm. And that argument went on for years. Uh, by, you know, in person and by letter, and they'd go on long walking tours together. 
and run over these same the same group of questions over and over again. And it had a profound impact on Lewis, which is important in, among other reasons, because though he didn't realize it at the time, Barfield was breaking down Lewis's intellectual defenses against theism and preparing mm-hmm. the way for Lewis's eventual acceptance of Christianity. Hmm. Um, so Barfield plays that very important role in Lewis's development. Um, yeah. yeah. And then Tolkien is another one who we know uh, he acknowledged, not as often or in such glowing terms, but he acknowledged Barfield's influence um, <laughs> in particularly how he understood the historical development of language. You know, Barfield had this idea that Tolkien actually coined a term for it, the theory of ancient semantic unity, um, this idea that language expressed uh, meanings that are no longer expressible in modern language, and because ancient languages sort of expressed a consciousness that was very foreign to our own, and that's that gets sort of to the heart of what Barfield thought, and it's a difficult idea. But both Lewis and Tolkien believed that Barfield was right about this. And Tolkien acknowledged in a few places that it um, it affected his thinking both as a, a philologist uh, professionally, but also in his fiction, which was very much uh, shaped by his understanding of language, what it was, what it is, what it does, that sort of thing. Do, do we have a sense of what Barfield thought of I, I'm thinking of the the different um, the exchanges between Lewis and Tolkien on what they thought of each other's fiction. You know, Lewis's glowing yeah. admiration for Lord of the Rings and Tolkien's yeah. kind of uh, how, do, how do I say this? <laughs> yeah, t- tepid affection for uh, the Chronicles of Narnia only because it it was so obviously allegorical. Not that Tolkien avoids allegory, even if he says he doesn't like it. Yeah, um, I'm wondering <laughs> if. Uh, how how where, where where Barfield's there? I mean, does does do we know what Barfield thought of the Chronicles of Narnia or the Lord of the Rings? Yeah, we we actually do. And I remember being very disappointed the day I found out that Barfield did not love the Lord of the Rings. In fact, oh, come on. I believe he said he started it and didn't finish it. Uh, but he said that in the context of his great admiration for Tolkien, it just you know Barfield was he had a one track mind. He he wrestled with the same questions throughout his life, and even his fiction reflects those concerns. And uh, so that was a, a big disappointment to me. Um, I'm n- not sure why it mattered to me that much, but <laughs> <laughs> uh, I guess I just tend to think that the people I admire must like Lord of the Rings. But well, well, I mean that's how I feel. I, I... Yeah. <laughs> but um... Lewis, of, Lewis loved a number of Barfield's works of fiction, uh, such as. Uh, this ever diverse pair. And then of course we know that Tolkien liked the short story, the fairy tale that Barfield wrote early on uh, that Tolkien read to his kids and told Lewis that it was a, a great hit and the kids loved it. Uh, and that's called the silver trumpet. Oh, okay. I think I, I've never read that story, but now that you say that I've, I've heard of that, I, I don't know anything about, about Barfield's fiction. How, um, yeah. I mean, I, were, was this a, a significant part of his corpus? I mean, are there several novels out there, or is it just a handful of things? He, he wrote quite a bit of fiction, though certainly Lewis and Tolkien, I think, had mastered that art more than he had. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, yeah. I do really love a lot of Barfield's fiction for what it is. Um, I think he, he wrote some, some great fiction, uh, but it's certainly, if you're going to read Barfield for the first time... I wouldn't recommend starting with his fiction. Right. Where where would you recommend starting? Uh, It depends. It depends on the reason you come to Barfield. (laughs) So obviously, if you're already an enthusiast of the other Inklings, start with Poetic Diction, because the other Mm -hmm. Inklings loved that book and were influenced by it. If you just want to know what Barfield is all about, uh, you may want to tackle Saving the Appearances. That's as close to a Barfieldian summa as we get. Um, but mm-hmm. then he also has some books of essays, such as The Rediscovery of Meaning, which give us, I think, the clearest and most succinct uh, portrayals of uh, the major themes in Barfield's work. Mm-hmm. Speaking of those major themes, uh, the, the, your book is centered on a one a very significant idea that shows up throughout his, his corpus, and that is the evolution 
of consciousness. Now, that sounds really intimidating. <laughs> I'm sure it is. Um, but it's a key idea. We can't really understand Barfield without it. So can you briefly explain what the evolution of consciousness is to our listeners? Yeah. So very inadequately, we could say that Barfield believed that people in the past didn't just have different thoughts than us. They had a different way of thinking. And because we are habitually unaware of this, we tend to misread and therefore uh, underappreciate the wisdom of the past. And so this is one reason why uh, Lewis said that Barfield destroyed his chronological snobbery, because he Barfield opened up Lewis's mind to appreciate uh, you know, great texts from the past, for example, on their own terms. But that's very difficult to do, because they didn't just have different thoughts, they had a different way of thinking. Now, we offer in our book a sort of preliminary definition of the evolution of consciousness, but then we spend most of the rest of the book trying to unpack it. So I can read that here, understanding that it does require a little bit of explanation. So we said that the evolution of consciousness is a theory that posits a process of fundamental change in the relation between the human mind and the material world. And this affects not only how people have perceived and understood the world, but it also affects the fundamental character of that which is perceived, the world itself. This change involves, among other things, a movement from conscious participation in the life of nature, and that's characteristic of pre-modern consciousness, to the self-conscious observation of nature that characterizes modern consciousness. Now, I know that's a lot. but I think that is as succinct as we can get in in defining this theory. I I think the best way to understand Barfield's theory is to dive in and see how it works concretely. You know, look at how Barfield is interpreting ancient texts and the flaws that he's pointing out in ordinary interpretations of ancient texts, and then you see it. You see that they really had a different way of thinking, a different form of consciousness in in ancient times, and that there's been this process that we can see, it's evinced in the history of language and other things, uh, by which human consciousness changes. Uh, Our minds come to relate differently to the world around us, and therefore, um, you know, there's all kinds of consequences that follow from that, good and bad. You know, we have this, modern people have a sort of self-consciousness that you can't see unless you read it into ancient literature. And that self-consciousness brings with it freedom and other good things, but it also uh, keeps us feeling detached, gives us a sense of the meaninglessness of the world, uh, whereas ancient people uh, felt more connected and were more spontaneously aware of the meaning that's inherent in the world around them. Um, And so you could talk all day about the the consequences of that. But that's as, right. as brief as I can make it. <laughs> One of the things that came up uh, when I'm thinking about the way you're describing this, the evolution of consciousness, because um, it's distinguished from, say, uh, the intellectual historian's preoccupation with the development of like the uh, intellectual history, like from mm-hmm. one idea to the next, mm-hmm. um, and simply changes in definition. All that stuff takes place, but it's much more... It's much more com- complex for someone like Barfield. Yeah. To what extent is his is this understanding of the evolution of consciousness also or, s- or related to or even synonymous with the evolution of imagination? Now, mm-hmm. I'm I'm wondering how he defines imagination because when I think of imagination, I think of it in the, uh, perhaps controversially um, as as synonymous with intuition that it's a kind of pre rational intuition of mm-hmm. what we think is good, true, and beautiful. Um, but others will see imagination, you know, like people like Hobbes, imagination is just another word for decaying sense. It's just mm-hmm. memory that's kind of just fading yeah. uh, that we hold on to after we've encountered something. Mm-hmm. To, how did Owen Barfield relate uh, this notion of consciousness and its evolution to uh, concepts of imagination? Yeah, it's a good question. So I think one way we can look at it is through the lens of what Barfield called the poetic and the rational principles that he saw as being at work in the history of the human mind. So the poetic being 
uh, you know, representing a, a mind that's characterized by imaginative activity. And then the rational principle characterizing a mind that uh, is primarily well, rational, you know, is the, the intellect comes before the imagination and that way of thinking. And Barfield sees, you know, the farther we look back, the more we see the prominence of the imaginative principle in the human mind. And then the farther we come forward, the more we see the prominence of the rational principle in the human mind. And he talks about this in Poetic Diction. So I think that in many, in many ways, the imagination for Barfield is exactly what we need. Uh, we need to exercise our imaginations, given our, you know, the self-consciousness that we've gained as a result of this evolution of consciousness. Uh, we need to exercise it in order to recover that which we're blind to as a result of our um, overdependence on the rational principle. So let me try to put that in in other terms. When we think back, and if if we try to read an ancient text you know, like Homer, we see a very different perception of and relation to the natural world, especially if you see past the. Uh, what Barfield calls logomorphism, or the, the fallacy by which we read our consciousness into ancient texts. And we see a totally different relation between the human mind and the natural world, and that relation is, um, as, as C.S. Lewis put it, it's, it's one where they looked along nature rather than at nature. And that comes from an essay called Meditations in a Tool Shed, where Lewis imagines himself in a dark tool shed, and there's a crack up near the ceiling, and there's a mm -hmm. beam of light coming in. He says, I can look at the light, and I see the light only. But if I look along the beam of light, I see out into the wider world of you know, blue skies and trees swaying in the wind. And he, he said that there's a sense in which modern people are always looking at the beam. We're trying to understand you know, the, the properties of, of light and that sort of thing. Uh, rather than looking along the beam and seeing what it reveals about the, the broader world. And ancient people tended to look along the world of nature, whereas we look at the world of nature. And for Barfield, to relate it to your question, it was through a disciplined exercise of the imagination that we might recover that ability that we've lost to look along the beam of nature rather than at it. And it's our tendency to look at it that makes us really good at science and technology and other things. But as Barfield puts it, we're like Odin. We've sacrificed an eye in order to gain that sophistication. And it's the imagination that allows us to, to see with both eyes again. Hmm. You know that, um, are you, I, I didn't think about it to the, just now when you're describing it. Are you familiar with the work of, um, Ian McGilchrist? Yes. The master and his emissary. That, that's what, what yes. you just described actually sounds like that. His argument in yes. but imagination are two different sides. Um, there's there's a great affinity between McGilchrist and Barfield, though huh. my experience is that people who are avid readers of Barfield feel very divided about whether McGilchrist is an adjacent writer or uh, merely appears to be. <laughs> That's interesting. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I, to, to be fair, I mean, they're... They're, they're coming at the world in very different ways. Mm -hmm. um, one is very scientific. One is very not, uh, mm -hmm. in a sense. Yeah. Um, which is not a criticism. It's, they're mm -hmm. just very different. Um, but that, that'd be an interesting thing uh, to yeah. write on. I've also mentioned, and we, we brought this up uh, before the podcast, about uh, an affinity, a potential affinity between Owen Barfield and Vogelin. Mm -hmm. uh, er, uh, Eric Vogelin, the, the German emigre yeah. uh, and, and historian, intellectual historian. Um, and, mm -hmm. uh, and I... I I, th I think there's a lot to be said about the, the late work of Vogelin and his understanding of consciousness mm -hmm. moving in a direction that I think Barfield would, would recognize, mm -hmm. um, but it was certainly not necessarily with the, with the same language. I think, I think Barfield would have, in some senses, a, a advantage here. I think, I think Coleridge is a better resource than some of the stuff that, that Vogelin was drawing on. Mm -hmm. Of course, Barfield's not only influenced by Coleridge, but I think, I think Coleridge has a lot to offer um, yeah. in this regard. Yeah. Uh, although, you know, Vogelin's still influenced by people like Kant and Schelling and others who mm -hmm. are also influencing uh, Coleridge. Anyway, yeah. I don't want to get off the track there. <laughs> um, but one of the things about it, it's an evolution, so things are changing, and that, that th th there's always going to be a tendency to think about 
what caused that change um, mm-hmm. historically in, in human consciousness. Um, is it primarily a material change? Is it do, does does consciousness change primarily with technology? Does it change with religion? Does it change? Um, you know yeah. what's 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 kind of the fundamental mechanism here? It now I don't get the impression that there's any um, how do I say this? We're we're not moving toward a perfection of human consciousness. It's just changing, right? It's not it's not like a Marxist idea of that eventually we're just all going to have this perfect society. Barfield's yeah. not saying eventually we're going to have a complete, you know, <laughs> uh, a comprehensive consciousness of all reality. Um, sure. But in, in, in a sense, it still is changing. So how do you, how do you describe that change and what, what, uh, pr- provokes it and how you understand it, how Barfield yeah. understands it? Yeah. Okay. So you have a, a couple things there I'd like to pick up on. First of all, and again, not to make this podcast about Lewis, but one of the big right. disagreements <laughs> between Barfield and Lewis was whether or not Barfield's insights into the, the history of the changes of human consciousness had any broader significance in any kind of transcendent cause. So if you look at uh, C.S. Lewis's essay on historicism, he thinks that the people who you know, might rightly recognize these changes in human consciousness um, are wrong if they think that we can discern that they have any, any broader meaning or transcendent cause or anything like that. And Barfield says that was the crux of the disagreement between him and Lewis in the latter part of Lewis's life. Um, and that Barfield thought, if you look at the history of language and poetry and you derive all these insights into the history of human consciousness, uh, you should boldly go ahead and interpret them as uh, as being significant. Whereas Lewis said, that's like looking for a face in the fire. Eventually you'll see it if you look, but it doesn't have any any kind of uh, significance. So So yes, I think Barfield was a historicist. In that sense, and he if you read Saving the Appearances, he he makes it, you know, blatantly theological. And he tells the history of human consciousness by making a big point about the the Hebrew people as we read about them in the Old Testament playing a crucial role, uh, presum- presumably a divinely ordained role in the development of human consciousness in such a way that it will reach its final goal. And then, of course, Christ is the center of that for Barfield, uh, as it was for Rudolf Steiner. And so there's a, a great little essay. It's actually a talk that Barfield gave at Wheaton College that may be the place, you know, if, if Christians want to know about Barfield, and especially if they're a little suspicious of, of him because they uh, are uncomfortable with anthroposophical elements of his thought, there's, there's an essay called uh, uh, The Religion of a Philologist, I believe it's what it's called. And it's just the transcript of a talk he gave at Wheaton, and he tells the story of how he came to believe that Christ was the divine son of God by, me, by studying the history of language and the developments of consciousness that it, uh, that it displayed to him. So that, that's a great place to go. It's a very accessible essay, gets at the core of Barfield's, uh, Barfield's philosophy. Um, so I did want to mention that um, Barfield does think it's going somewhere. We started with this, this original consciousness, and we've lost much in the process by which we've gained this sort of self-conscious freedom. But Barfield thinks through the, the disciplined use of imagination, we can regain what we've lost and go on to, he calls it, final participation. Of this, you know, how, how we can, um, you know, recover the good that's been lost while keeping the good that we've gained. And he interprets this in blatantly theological and indeed uh, Christian terms. Uh, but Lewis wasn't wasn't quite persuaded by all that. So, okay. Um, just want to say art to our listeners. Are you all still with us? That's this. This, this we're getting <laughs> deep here. Um, but I think that's what this is. What's so? Uh, it's just encouraging to think about um, a lot of this stuff. Also, I you know I'm still thinking about something you said almost at the very beginning of the podcast. We referred to the Inklings as a 
a, a what do you say a mutual criticism society something like um, that yeah something like, I mean that, that's that's a great way to think of it I mean how unusual it is just to be part of something like that where we've agreed to um, come together and strengthen each other through friendly criticism maybe mm-hmm. <laughs> maybe biting criticism maybe yeah. uh, uncomfortable criticism but we're still going to be friends yeah. um, afterwards so it, that that idea that such basic idea is very foreign I think to our our yeah. c- uh, context today and, yeah. and Barfield and Lewis represent, you know, how we, uh, a, a way forward in many ways. Yeah. Um, is it, is, didn't Lewis write something on like the art of disagreement? Am I remembering that right now? Where um, he talks about how he disagreed with Barfield. Well, he talks a lot in surprised by joy about their disagreements, about how they yeah. were, instead of being an, uh, a barrier to friendship, they were actually the occasion to their friendship. Uh, they both loved a good disagreement and were happy to spend days and days walking, uh, you know, mulling over some minute point that they couldn't quite come to terms on. It's all really inspiring stuff to me. Yeah. As as with re- reading any of this. Now, I want to I'll close with this question. Um, you started to answer this earlier, but one, one of the key parts about, and again, we've already said this to a point where the... The, the, the whole idea of chronological snobbery, mm-hmm. that um, we think we're so smart and that we've got all this, we've got everything put together, that somehow the, the, the later we, we get in, in human history, the, the better we are or um, uh, in, in, in different ways. But Barfield is pointing out, like, look, there's a, you, you, you need to think about the, the consciousness and, and the context in which, um, in particular, ancient people thought or medieval people thought. Um, why, why does it matter? I think, uh, that, that these, that the, um, how do I say this, that the consciousness of ancient people is very different from our own. Um, why not just be preoccupied with the consciousness of our, of, of our, of, of of the self, of our individuals, um, or, or of of our contemporary context? Why, why does this matter? Because I think this, this gets to a key point. I mean, Barfield's worth reading on his own for his own sake, mm-hmm. um, not just as a contemporary of Lewis and Tolkien, but mm-hmm. for his own ideas. Um, but why why are Barfield's ideas themselves mm-hmm. um, relevant beyond uh, just as j- j- just for their own sake? What, what what difference does it make? Yeah. So if we misunderstand the past, we are bound to um, fail to to give it uh, give it the opportunity to transform us. We are, if, if we're victims of chronological snobbery, which Lewis defined, let's see, I have it here, the uncritical acceptance of the intellectual climate common to our own age and the assumption that whatever has gone out of date is on that count, account discredited is, uh, I believe, uh, that assumption, assumption is fatal to any real deep transformative learning. You know, we will just sort of take what we happen to pick up, but just like we would not call a person mature intellectually or morally if they just believed everything they were told because they were told it and because it was safe and familiar and comfortable. Well, Barfield is saying, you know, we modern people, despite our internal disagreements, are all still a little bit too comfortable. We're too comfortable with what we assume, with what we take for granted, with the world as we perceive it. And uh, he makes us uncomfortable by showing us actually we're quite provincial on historical standards. There's, there's a whole lot here that we've not even comprehended, much less come to terms with and appreciating its value and its wisdom. Uh, we've not really let the past, the great thinkers and artists of the past, challenge us until um, we've really understood them on their own terms. And that's really hard because we're not just talking about differences in ideas or beliefs. We're talking about differences in consciousness that fundamental aspect of each of our minds that conditions how we experience and perceive and think about the world. And so Barfield makes people uncomfortable, and that's that's part of his value. And uh, he made Lewis uncomfortable, but we see that that was transformative for him in, in a way that has had you know ripple effects across the world for Christians and others who have been inspired and instructed by his writings. There's a lot to be said of that. I think there's uh, the, the it seldom. I'll just speak anecdotally. Seldom have I ever had really, really 
insightful thoughts when I'm comfortable. Um, I I mean, if I'm comfortable, the the thought may be, uh, I'd like a beer or I'd like to take a nap. I mean, that's about (laughs) as deep as it gets. But discomfort, discomfort really makes you um, Mm -hmm. wrestle. Yeah. I actually, just last night, I had a really interesting conversation with a gentleman, fellow Christian, talking about uh, questions of trust and mm-hmm. questions of, you know, what, what it means to um, be, be the church and community. And we disagreed on some significant points, and I was uncomfortable at times. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, there, there was a trust between he and I, which yeah. I think Lewis and Barfield shared, where it was, you, you don't, you know, we're not disagreeing in a way that is personal or angry. We know what's at stake in this. Mm-hmm. And um, it would be a tragedy if we didn't struggle with it. It would also be tragic if we tried to struggle with it alone, mm-hmm. right? I think there's yeah. th- this one of the beautiful things with the Inklings example is their 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 belief that you tr- don't. I mean, of course, they're all scholars and nerds, right? We mm-hmm. all spend time alone. <laughs> I mean, wrestling with yeah. these different readers and stuff. I mean, that that's part of our life. But um, at the same time, they they didn't stay that way. They they knew they had to have some kind of community. Mm-hmm. Um, from the very beginning, mm-hmm. um, I, they they all show that in different ways. Yeah. Um, well, I uh, I am really encouraged by this book uh, and its existence, <laughs> um, and I I really I really hope it uh, get, get, gets the attention it deserves. There's so much we didn't cover, yeah. um, and I'm I'm kind of sad we have to conclude at this point. But thank you so much, Landon. Yeah, thank you. Um, and uh, once again, this is what Barfield thought. An Introduction to the Work of Owen Barfield with Cascade Books, written by Landon Lofton and Max Leaf. Um, with that, I'd like to t- say that you've been listening to The Sower, a production of the Ciceronian Society. If you've enjoyed this conversation and would like to meet more people like Landon, uh, we hope you'll consider joining us for our 2024 conference in Plano, Texas, February 29th through March 2nd. Panel and paper proposals are due by September 1st, 2024, and more information can be found on our website. And I should say that anyone who's interested in proposing papers on the Inklings and on Barfield, on the evolution of conscience, uh, other people we've talked about, Lewis, Vogelin, um, uh, Rudolf Steiner, all of that would be very, very relevant. Uh, uh, Coleridge, another uh, good topic. Um, all that would be great for, for this conference and would be a good idea to send our way. So um, check that out and be sure to rate and review this podcast, share it with your friends, Go to our website, ciceronianssociety.org, and may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Thank you for listening.